What I wanted to talk about today is the concept of a killer app and how we're going to find the killer app in this space. It's a, th it's a topic that comes up with uh, Bitcoin also. And one of the most common questions I get asked is, what is the killer app? So do you have some thoughts about what is the killer app in Ethereum? And replacing Bitcoin isn't the correct answer, by the way. <laughs> um, you know, this is this is an interesting question. When people look out at the landscape of all the possible applications that might exist, whether it's in Bitcoin or Ethereum, you kind of map out what you think might be a space. Um, that's not always the first thing that will happen. You know, some applications require prerequisites. They require infrastructure, or they require a large concentration of users in a specific geography, or they require an industry that has a lot of users all working together to adopt a technology. Um, you don't get, you know, the same applications in the beginning of technology as you do after it's matured for a while. Think about the internet for a while and look back. I, I was around in the early days of the internet. I remember in 1992, like everybody knew that video on demand was going to be an app. I mean, it's a no-brainer. You don't, you don't really need a lot to figure out that video on demand will be a killer app. Now, I remember the first video conferencing demonstration I participated in. It involved uh, two rooms, about two million pounds worth of equipment, and a connection over fiber between the University of London uh, and a university in the United States. Uh, it was the culmination of a two-year project, and it was pretty much what you would do today on a Skype call. So, video on demand, obvious, but not yet. Not going to happen anytime soon, and kind of Netflix or something like that. The ability to do that certainly not going to happen anytime soon. So you have to think when you're thinking about the killer app. It's not simply the set of applications that might possibly be implemented. It's also what can be implemented with what you have today. What requires the least infrastructure investment? What requires the least density of users, and yet? provides a viable solution to a real problem. And that's the question that I spend a lot of time thinking about. Now, in Bitcoin, we kind of see where that is going. There is a, an intersection of high-value cross-border payments that are particularly difficult. Difficult because there is currency controls, difficult because your government is nuts and they're printing one hundred trillion dollar bills, difficult because um, you have very high fees or low opportunities for banking. That's a sweet spot, right? And the reason it's a sweet spot is because it doesn't take much to be better. Like you can be slow, and all you have to do is not be as slow as the banks. You can be expensive, and all you have to do is not be as expensive as the banks, and you have a viable solution to a real problem. And all it takes to adopt that solution is the sender and the recipient to participate. You don't need massive infrastructure to do that. Okay, so what is what is in fact the killer app for Ethereum? And in Bitcoin we've gone off the rails and everybody's gone blockchain crazy. <laughs> Let them call it blockchain, says the t-shirt, making fun of this idea that everything is a blockchain, right? Anything that used to be a database is now a blockchain, and suddenly, magically, it acquires these capabilities: immutability, censorship resistance, neutrality, borderless operation, etc., which are not really characteristics of a blockchain. Uh, there are characteristics of specific types of blockchains, but if you just take a database and shove some hashes in it, that does not an immutable blockchain make. Um, but it makes some good money for consultants. So everything's a blockchain, right? So what's happening in Ethereum? Everything's a DAP. App plus D, DAP. <laughs> Let's DAP this, DAP that, DAP the next thing. Let's DAP everything. Everything DAP. DAP the world. Which is kind of the same thing. And and also it attracts all the wrong kind of attitudes, the wrong kind of people. Right? The sharks start circling. They're like, there's money in the water. 
There's VCs throwing money at stuff they don't understand. We've got a hype term. It's the new web 2.0. Let's run for it. Let's take what we were doing before, slap blockchain in front, and now what we're doing is cool and, most importantly, fundable. Let's take what we were doing, slap DAP in front, and what we were doing is now fundable. And there's a danger there. You're seeing it already. Um, I don't want to be too harsh on the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, but <laughs> these are not your friends. Right? <laughs> the idea that all of these enterprises are going to bring their magnanimous attention down to your technology and make it suddenly shine in their enterprise applications, for the most part, what they are interested in is forking the code and creating closed, boring versions of it that they can sell to management. And as long as you are not doing anything disruptive, they are going to ride the Ethereum pony for a while. But eventually, mark my words, there is going to be a time when what you do is disruptive and interesting enough that they are going to say the magic words. We are interested in the technology behind Ethereum. DApps, not Ethereum itself. Sound familiar? <laughs> mark my words, that is going to happen, unless you don't really do anything interesting. But if you do, that's what's going to happen. So again, what is the killer app? Because it's not a DAP. And what I think it is, is the DAO. The DAO. The DAO is dead. Long live the DAO. <laughs> what? What is the essence of Ethereum? <laughs> to me, it's smart contracts, right? Where do people usually use contracts? Most contracts. Most contracts I've ever signed, most contracts I've ever written, are for business-to-business -business interactions. Yeah, I sign some contracts as a consumer, but I do far more contracts through my businesses. Contracts are what make businesses run. So, and there's a particularly interesting aspect to that, which is that private commercial contracts between two businesses are not subject to anybody's regulation. I can choose what jurisdiction I want to operate in. I can choose my choice of law. And as long as it is an affair between my corporation and another corporation, it's nobody's business what we write in that contract. That's a wide open space. It doesn't offend regulators. It doesn't get into the side of business and governments. It's just kind of neutral. It's nice. And there's a particular type of contract that's the most interesting, which is the very basic contract. It's the first contract you should do in any business. What's the first contract you should do in any business? Articles of organization. It's the hey partner, don't screw me over and run away with all the money contract. Right? It's how you make sure that the people you are forming this association, this venture, this vehicle are going to behave the way you expect them to behave. That's the first contract. The corporation itself is a contract. And that contract is the most critical contract, because that's the opportunity where Ethereum can reinvent what it means to be a corporation in the modern world. The very essence of a corporation, the decentralized, autonomous organization. That's the killer app. It's the space that regulators don't care about. For the most part, it's the space where you have the greatest freedom to invent completely new ways, systems for humans to organize on a massive scale. It's Ethereum's moonshot. It's the possibility of taking this to a whole new level, taking it into a moon orbit, if you like. There's a problem with that. And that is that going into moon orbit requires rocket science. And writing smart contracts to organize corporations is rocket science. So what is the essential understanding of rocket science? It is that fundamentally there is very little difference between a rocket and a bomb. <laughs> In terms of fundamental chemistry, a rocket is a very large exothermic reaction. The difference between a rocket and a bomb is that a rocket is a controlled exothermic reaction, where all of the output is directed in a very specific direction. Right? Think of that as governance. So it's a bomb with governance. Right? That's the difference. <laughs> a rocket is what happens when you do governance on explosives. The problem is 
that when people see the awesome power of a rocket, most of the time, they are really excited by the big boom possibility, the explosive side of things. And this also applies to smart contracts, because in smart contracts, money is the fuel, and the smart contract is governance. And the rocket science of a smart contract is ensuring that the fuel of money that is managed by the smart contract doesn't blow up in your face. So, when you're doing rocket science, it's very disappointing when Stevie, your neighbor, decides to strap a lawn chair to 150,000 kilograms of highly explosive fuel and says, "I shall conquer human spaceflight." They don't think governance is so important. <laughs> and what happens when you build that form of human spaceflight? The problem is, it will forever mar the idea of human spaceflight. From that moment on, anybody who is searching for the term human spaceflight will go online, and the first result will be a YouTube video of Stevie Boy creating a ginormous crater in their backyard and turning themselves into Stevie Mist. Because while they had the kinetic energy captured in 150,000 kilograms of highly explosive fuel, they forgot about the governance. And the governance is the killer app. It's how you take funds and manage them, how you take the energy of a community and manage it how you reinvent the corporation. Every time you think about writing a DAO, there is this little siren call that says, we could raise a lot of money with this thing. <laughs> Resist that call. Because the way you achieve the awesomeness of a moon orbit with Ethereum is by very careful, very conservative governance that iterates and matures over a long period of time. That is a killer app. That can change how we do corporations. But in order to do that, you must make sure not to put too much fuel. If you try to build an Atlas V on day one, you will make a big crater. And you'll keep doing that for as long as you decide that the first step is moon orbit. Let's not do moon orbit. How about low Earth orbit? Right? How about getting off the launch pad? How about a horizontal harnessed engine test? And that's really the challenge with Ethereum right now, but also the tremendous opportunity. The killer app is smart contracts that redefine the modern corporation. The DAO, the decentralized autonomous organization. But if you go search for the DAO, what do you find? Stevie Boy blowing himself up into a giant crater. So it's actually ruined the opportunity to do the killer app because the opportunity to put a lot of fuel into that engine overlooked the maturity of the governance. And what we need is a lot more work on the maturity of the governance. But those who do that work, it's going to take 20 years to get the overnight success. But one day that vehicle is going to go into a moon orbit. Thank you.